Hi, this is Jose Luis, and welcome to a new video on this series, Introduction to Parametric Modeling. In this video, what I would like to teach you is to take any object on Rhino or whatever something is someone is giving you, uh, and then be able to create a three-dimensional array of objects from that original surface or curve or whatever that is. And of course, a grid that is controllable in the of how far away the objects are in the x direction and how many elements are in the x direction or the y direction or the c direction. Everything fully parametrically controlled. And I would also like to make a case about a the difference between doing this copying and arraying directly on the BREP object or instead going through intermediate planes that are the ones that we actually generate uh, as, a, as an array and then reorienting that geometry on top of those planes. I will talk about the differences between the two approach, approaches and what are the pros and cons. Okay, so follow me on this video as, um, as we get hands on and we practice everything that we have learned in the previous videos on this series. Let's start. Let's get started. As usual, I would like to spend a little bit of time talking through the problem and designing it and thinking it through before I go into the nitty gritties of implementing it. Okay. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to imagine that what I have as an input is some random shape that it's already be being given to me. The idea here is that I don't, I do not have the possibility of creating a three dimensional grid numerically from scratch, but just because I have some geometry that is the one that I need to I need to create a three dimensional grid with. And therefore, that's why the technique that we're going to use in this exercise is not generative, if you will, we're not going to create sequences of numbers and create a 3D grid with those numbers. But what we're going to do is we're going to try to get this object, and we're going to start copying in the x and y and z directions, so that we can create a three dimensional matrix out of that. And the way we're going to do that is first, we're probably going to copy this object in one direction in the x direction. And we would like to be able to control the interval between those elements. And for example, how many elements are there in that list? Maybe part of the problem proposition is that we need to fill a space with this one. So instead of um, the distance between them and the amount of objects, maybe we have the total distance and the amount of objects that would be a slightly different problem. But for here, we're just going to control the distance between object and the amount of them in one direction. And then we will have to then take that and propagate it into the second direction and controlling that distance between objects in that direction and how many of them. And then similarly, we will have to take all of that and project it and, com and copy it into the third dimension. This is going to be a super simple process. It's just going to involve a little bit of data manipulation for the reasons that I will explain very soon as we start working with, with the geometry. So let's go back to Grasshopper and give this a try. We're going to start very simple. What we're going to do is we're going to imagine that we have some input geometry that somebody gave us. I'm using this random letter P that I used in my previous video, which is basically I typed a letter, I exploded the letter, and then I extruded it into a solid and then rotated a little bit in 3D space to get this. Okay, this is the P uh, that we use in parametric camp. Woo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> and then I have dropped here six sliders that represent both the interval between objects in each direction, X, Y, and Z, and how many elements do we want in each one of those directions. Now, what I need to do is I need to go to geometry, I need to go to BREP and drop an empty parameter component that I can right click on to set the input parameter here so that I bring the BREP into Grasshopper, and then I can start working with it. So as per our diagram, what I would like to do first is I would like to create a, two, a 1D array in the X direction, then a 2D array in the, two, in the Y direction, and a 3D array into the C direction. So I'm going to do that at intervals. And the way I'm going to do that is, first of all, I'm going to create a one dimensional array as and as we saw in the previous video, I can generate if I can do that by moving the original geometry. So this is the V rep, moving it by a series of vectors in the x direction that are at the intervals 
that I want to move this object on. If you are not familiar with this technique, please make sure to check my previous video on this series and uh, where I explain what I did a simple example for that. So what I'm going to do is first I'm going to create a series. I'm going to go to sequence series and I'm going to create a numerical series that starts at zero. I'm going to keep that there. Then the step size is going to be this much in the x direction and the amount of numbers is going to be this much. Just for the sake of visual clarity, I'm going to plug here a panel to make sure that I can see that I have now this numerical series that goes from zero to nine. And then I'm going to use that to create vectors. So I'm going to construct vectors from x, y, z components. And then I'm going to plug this into the x input. And I'm going to visualize the vectors that I'm getting out. So you can see that I get a collection of vectors in the x directions with 0, 1 through 3, blah, 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 and all those lengths. If I use those vectors to move my original B rep, then what I'm effectively creating is a copy of all these B reps that R is the first one because it's a copy in place and then all the other ones in the X direction. And as we said, I can control now the increment in that direction and I can control how many elements I have in that direction. All right. So I'm going to start grouping things. So this is my inputs and this is the uh, array. Wait, so this is going to be the array in X direction. Okay, I'm going to do that because things are going to start getting messy very soon. All right, wonderful. So I'm ready now to start copying all these objects into the Y direction. For the y direction, I'm going to follow a very similar process to what I've done before, which is I'm going to just copy this series and this vector. Okay, I'm going to copy this series and I'm going to make sure that I plug in the y interval and I'm going to move it a little bit to make a difference and the y interval. And then I can see that from my series, now I have a bunch of numbers from 0 to 11, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm going to co copy this component and paste it. And instead of x, which I'm going to disconnect, I'm going to use these numbers for the y property, for the y coordinate of the vector. And you can see that I now have a collection of vectors with 0 and 0 for the x and c, but the y coordinates are this sequence of numbers. So now, it should be as simple as finding a move component, right? And then taking this geometry, all of taking using those translation vectors to move this row of P B reps that I have generated in the past, right? But if I do that, we're going to see that uh, we're not getting exactly the result that we wanted. Let me, let me, let me crank this down a little. So we have so we're not getting the result that we wanted. We're getting this kind of arrow, this kind of diagonal here, and then these repeated elements here. So as per my preachings and my teachings in this series, when we have something that is going wrong and we're not sure what it is, what did I say that was the most likely cause <laughs> for these kind of problems? I'll give you one minute. Do, 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 do. You don't need one minute. It should be like one second. So the most probable cause of this is probably related to data, okay? And the structure of the data that we're working with. So let's take a closer look at the data between these two, uh, these two scenarios. So for example, let's take a look at the structure of the data that is coming into this component. We can see that on one hand, we have the B reps that we generated in the X direction. The structure of this data is a tree that has one branch called 00, zero and that has all the lists inside of it. And the structure of the data that is going into the vector is another tree that has one branch that is also called 00, zero like the previous one and has four objects. As we said in previous videos, the way the default behavior of grasshopper components, and this is specific to grasshopper, is that when it needs to match two incoming streams of data from different inputs, 
The way that it does is that if they belong, if they have branches with the same name, it will take the elements of those branches with the same name and it will match them one to one. So that's why the result that we're getting here is the first B rep is the first B rep with the first vector and the vector is zero, zero. So this B rep is staying in place. Second B rep was this one here with a 1.38 vector. So that's why the result is moving a little bit here. The third one with the third vector goes here. The fourth one with the fourth vector goes here. And the fifth one, because there is no fifth vector in this branch, what Grasshopper does is that it maintains, it picks the last element of the list, which is this four point something vector. And that's why all the rest of the B reps on this list are translated by the last element of this list. This behavior we said it's referred to in Grasshopper as long list matching. So this is the cause of the problem. And but we want to solve this. So how can we do that? Well, if I said, and I think we've done this in previous videos, if I said that the problem is that they are being matched one to one, because both have the same branch names, and that's not the behavior that I want. What I want is for each one of these B reps to be matched with all the four vectors so that we get this one, this one, this one, and this one, then all one, another one, another one, another one. Then what I need to do is I need to change the structure of this data or the or, or this other data tree, doesn't matter which one we choose, so that the branch names are not the same and that each one of these elements are on its own branch so that it gets matched with all the other elements of the other data tree. And which data manipulation, which data tree manipulation do we know that takes all the elements on a list and it places them into a new branch just for their own? We know that we can do that with grafting. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to place here and I'm going to graft this tree. As I graft this tree, you can see that I'm going to graft it and the result is going to be that now the tree has one branch per item. And as I do that, and as I feed that into the move component, you can see that now the result that we're getting is, let's take a look at this data. I get, how awesome is this? Well, let me keep this, uh, let me keep this here for visual comparison. What we're getting is that this VREP gets matched with the four vectors. So now I have this branch with four VREPs. Now this second VREP gets matched with the, all four vectors and I have these four B reps in the second branch, and so on, and so on, and so on. All right. And you can see that I also have some kind of duplicate here. These are darker because I have these elements and I also have these elements here. So I'm going to deactivate their visualization. Okay. All right. So I think we just need to now wait. So let me move this here. And I'm going to keep things a little clean. So this is going to be, this is going to be array in, array in the Y direction. Okie dokie. And I think we're now ready to try arraying this into the C direction. Let's give that a try. Let's start by the simple stuff. So let's start by going here and then creating another series that is going to take this and it's going to take this and I'm going to crank this up a little bit. I'm going to reduce the amount so that it's uh, easier to see. Okay. And then, so we have a series now and this series is values from is three numbers from zero to five, basically. Let, let's just do this. Yes. So from zero to five, and then I'm going to create now new vectors. I'm going to construct a new vector which is going to take this, these numbers as the C coordinates. And you can see, oops, those are the lengths. So you can see that the vectors are now 0, 0, 0, 2 point and 0, 0, 5. And now what I would like to do is I would like to take this. Let me add a few more values here. I would like to take all of these guys and move them in C according to those new vectors. So I'm going to move all of this stuff. 
I'm going to use these vectors for translation and I'm going to move all this geometry here. And no, what just happened here? Well, that looks like the same problem that we had before, doesn't it? So what is going on here? Well, let's take a look again at the data. So what's happening is that uh, the way gra Grasshopper is matching this data is, is taking the five, the five B reps and is matching them one to one with the four vectors. And because there's only four, the fifth B rep gets duplicated with the fourth vector. And that's why we have this like staircase kind of situation here. And that goes on, on and on and on. So now what can we do again? We can do the exact same operation. What we can do is we can take this tree and we can graft it again. We can graft it again so that each one of these elements gets its own branch and therefore it gets matched with each one of the C vectors that I want to use as a grid. So what are we going to do here? I'm going to graph this again. I'm going to graph tree. I'm going to plug this in here. I'm going to take a look. This is very useful. Let's take a look at the tree. And you can see that the tree is actually now super interesting. Look at how the tree before had 0, 1, 2, and 3. And now as we graft another level, we are another level and now we have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then we have 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and then we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So this actually, you can see how we're keeping track of the history of the data manipulation throughout the levels of the information on the data tree, which is kind, is super, super nice. Losing this would be a shame because this could be useful at some point down the road. So now if I do this and I plug that into my component, you can see that I now have an array of 200 B reps that have been, that have been populated in 3D. All right. And then I'm going to turn off the visualization of all the previous ones. And then you can see that now I have all my 3D arrays here. I love all my, not all my 3D arrays, but I have a, like all the, all the geometry that I've generated in my three-dimensional array here, which is kind of, it's pretty cool. Before I discuss another topic that I would like to highlight, let me, as, as we typically do, let me please uh, group this and say this is the array in the C direction. Okay, so this is great. And um, so now I would like to highlight something. This that we have done, it's okay and it works, it's pretty intuitive. However, um, if you look at the result, the outcome here we have at the end of the day created 200 elements, right? Now, the problem is that in order to do that operation, because we started by copying in the x direction, then we copied in the y direction, and then we copied in the z direction, it turns out that in order to reach these 200 objects here, in on the way, we had to work, we had to generate the first line of elements, so that was 10 elements, and then we needed to generate the other, uh, all the elements in the y direction, which were an additional 50 elements. So in order to create 200 elements, we needed to create 60 B reps on the way, which is more than 25% of the final tally for this one, which in computational terms, it's okay for such a small amount, it's doable, but if we were working with thousands or with millions of B reps, then probably that would have been super, super costly to do. So this approach is probably not the cleanest or the most elegant one and definitely not the most optimal in memory because in memory right now we have 60 more B reps than we actually need to. So let me propose an alternative method for doing this. So something that we could have done is instead of copying the whole B rep over and over and uh, before we created the 3D array, a technique that we could have done is instead of create, copying the whole thing, we could have worked by copying and arraying a plain object that is way, way more lightweight and takes much less space in memory. And then once we have the three-dimensional array of, of planes, then we could have in one clean operation 
reoriented the one B rep into all these planes. So that's actually going to be a super, super easy operation to redo here. So I'm going to basically copy all of this and I'm going to duplicate this exercise down here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, instead of working by copying and duplicating the B rep, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a plane. I'm going to feed that plane into my 3D replication pipeline. And then once I have a, an array of 3D planes, then I will reorient the original geometry. So how am I going to do this? I'm going to add a point here, for example, that's going to, that I'm going to import this point here. Okay. And then I'm going to create an X, Y plane on top of that point. So that's going to be my reference plane. And then remember that moving as an input can take any geometry, it can take curves, surfaces, whatever. So I can feed here, I can feed here this plane. And what you can see is that I have just created an array, a 3D array of planes with dimensions that I can control. So that's great. So now the only thing that I need to do is now here in my output, what I can do is I can, with Euclidean's, I can reorient some object, all right? And the object is going to be the B rep that I was using. The source parameter, the initial plane is going to be the plane that I created for reference. And then the target are going to be all the planes that I just created in 3D. And then this operation took the processing of all these planes in 3D, but as, as an operation is way more elegant way more lightweight and much, much faster to do. And especially if we had had thousands or millions of objects, it would have been an increase, like a significant increase in performance and a much more elegant operation, by the way. So as bottom line, as much as you can, please stick or please try to use planes because there will always be a much nicer uh, and much more lightweight uh, object to work with. And then they will have, they will be so plentiful in information that uh, it will be, yeah, I, I don't know. It will be, try to work with planes as much as you can. Uh, that's my bottom line, I think. <laughs> okay. And this was the exercise uh, of creating a three-dimensional grid of objects. If you liked this video, maybe consider liking the video, um, subscribing to the channel, turning on notifications and all those kind of things. And um, I think what I'm going to do now on the next video, I'm going to make a very similar example working with 2D grids, but because we're going to be working with planes now specifically, I'm going to show you ways of manipulating that plane and rotating it to create more interesting effects than just the simple 3D gridding of a particular object. So follow me on the next video, if you will. I think it's going to be cool. And thank you for watching and see you on the next videos on this series. Bye bye. Thank you.